where you can only do a part, or you can do a part of it. So now we move on to very broadly. So the idea here is we'll think about, app so what are applications? What are we talking about here? What do you think of when I say applications? It's not a wrong answer. Yeah? Set of programs which are built to work together to achieve goals. Okay, programs that work together to achieve a goal. supposed to do. If it's not supposed to crash when we send it stuff, and we send it stuff and it crashes, right? we've got it to do something it's not supposed to do. If it's not supposed to give us everyone's social security numbers, but we send a SQL injection vulnerability that makes it give us all of its uh, social security numbers, we made it do something that it, cannot, it was not supposed to do. And so fundamentally, that's what we are thinking about. So we need to try to Get these applications to violate the security of the system. Yeah. What do you mean by intention? Intended by who? What do you think? Well, you say things like, well, make it give student IDs. I mean, you could argue that if the program, in fact, gives student IDs, it was intended to give student IDs. So I would say from the original programmer, from the owner, <coughs> these are all different people with whole different ideas about what the intention of a program 
Yes, so this is what makes this tricky and difficult. Um, so I like to, did I give the, did I give the Wikipedia example in here? No, I don't think so, yeah, okay. Uh, so yes, I like to think about, I like to give the example similar to that. So let's say I told you there is a website that I could change any page on that website to be whatever I want. Is that a vulnerability? It depends. If it's CNN, is that a vulnerability? If it's Wikipedia, is that a vulnerability? No. No. Well, it depends. They have blocking mechanisms, but you know, whatever. I can still edit a lot of Wikipedia, right? So yeah, so context is incredibly important. So that is your job as a security analyst is to understand the application, to understand what is this supposed to do? And that actually leads to a lot of arguments sometimes between security researchers and developers because they say, well, yeah, it's supposed to do that, right? So either the security analyst misunderstood the purpose, like you said, in student ID numbers, if uh, there was a vulnerability where anybody could access all the student ID numbers in this class, that would be a huge vulnerability that's actually violating uh, student privacy laws. But when I go to my ASU, I can see all your student IDs, right? Because I have to for business teaching purposes, right? So the same behavior in different contexts and different applications could be insecure or could be secure. So it's incredibly important to think about that. <coughs> Good point. So when we think about security, right, we want to either violate the confidentiality, right? The application said this should remain secret, but I can read it. We can violate the integrity. The application wants this data to not be changed by some random user, right? But we can violate that. We can maybe violate the availability, right? This application should be available to all network users, and if we take it down, it's not available for all network users. So the way I like to think about applications, and so to do this, what can we influence? So we said the behavior of the application is determined by the code it runs, the data that it runs on, and the environment in which it executes. What can we control? The data. Fundamentally, the input is essentially the only thing we can change. If we can change the code, that's a huge problem. Right? We can already change the code. We can fundamentally make it do anything. Right? If we can change the environment, We'll see, sometimes we can change the environment, sometimes not. That depends on where the application's running, right? If it's a local application running on our machine, yeah, we can change the environment and mess with it all we want, right? If it's a remote application on a server that we don't have access to, then we can't modify or change the environment at all. So this is really important to keep in mind. And so to do that, I want to think about, okay, this is like at a high level how we can think about applications. So we have you know, the application, right? the code of the application. It's running in some environment. right? On top of that, you can even think it's running on an operating system. So you can separate out maybe the environment from the operating system. It has access to a network, oftentimes. There's a file system. There are other processes on the computer right, that can maybe talk, try to talk to this application. There's a terminal where you as a user can use the computer, right? So is it, so if I'm sitting at my computer at a terminal, am I locally on that? Is that a local application I'm using? Maybe. When would it be? local process on this machine, right? So when I'm at a terminal, I boot up a terminal, I'm on my machine, I can run LS and CAT, those are all programs that are running on my local machine. Now when I SSH into, let's say, the submission server, and I run the MySQL command because somebody forgot their password again, am I local or remote? Both, you want to explain? Something is running on your computer that's communicating with the, the code running on the server. Mm -hmm. So in that way, you have both a local connection and a remote 
Yeah, so I like to think of that, even in that case, I'm remote. So essentially this terminal part, I'm just connected remotely to the terminal of that computer, but it's exactly the same as if I'm sitting in front of that computer typing in commands, right? This is an important thing to think about when you think about remote local distinctions, right? Because I have access to that machine. I have as much access as if I was logged into that machine sitting directly in front of it, at least from the program. Right, so the application, so when you think about where does the application get input from, right? Well, if you get input from the terminal, from a local user, right, who's using the application, it can get input by reading files from the file system. It can get input from the network, from talking to other network services. And it can even get information from other processes, right? So this is remote procedure calls. You could get uh, information from other processes on the system. So what are all the ways that we can influence an application? You could put a file on the operating system. Uh, yeah, the file system, right? We can mess with the file system. Maybe that'll change the behavior of the application. What else? What was that? The network. Maybe we can mess with the network. What if we inject packets into the network or drop packets or sniff? What else? The terminal, we could give input that's weird, right? To try to make it crash. And other processes, right? Yeah, exactly. So this is why I like this diagram. But what else? There's one other thing. The environment, yeah. If we can control that environment and change the way the program executes, then maybe we can influence what this application does. So these are all the things you need to think about when you're trying to break an application is how, what are all the things that I control, right, that can be input to this program, right? And this applies, this applies if you're talking about an application running on your desktop or that applications that are running on a server or applications that are running on your phone, right? All of these kinds of things are important um, in all of those domains. So what we're going to be looking at and studying is application vulnerability analysis. So what's vulnerability analysis? What's a vulnerability for you now? How easy is it to break something? Almost. How easy is it to break something? It's usually hard. Yeah. The weak point in the system? Yeah, so finding, so vulnerability is any bug that can be used to uh, compromise the security of the application. So it's typically something that's not intended for by definition, not intended, right? So that's a vulnerability. So vulnerability analysis is essentially finding vulnerabilities. So analyzing a system in order to identify the vulnerabilities that are in that system. Specifically, when we talk about application vulnerability analysis, we're focusing on finding vulnerabilities in applications. When we look later at web application vulnerability analysis, we're gonna look at how to find vulnerabilities specifically in web applications. So what kind of vulnerabilities are there? Are they all the same? What types of vulnerabilities can there be? What was that? Code related. Code? So it, like in what kind of way though? Like maybe there's a bug in the code, like a memory corruption bug or something, some undefined behavior. So like the code is written, the code itself has a bug. Yeah, so that would be one. Yeah. Design. It's got an architectural problem. Design. So what would be an example of that? Uh, um, I asked, uh, so I can think of one. It uses uh, a vulnerable data structure that you can take advantage of if mm. you're aware of it. OK, that's good. So like uh, Python and the other languages had this with web requests. So the um, hash table, everybody knows hash tables. Right, so the hash table implementation has what of access and insert? What big O implementation? Big O one, all the time? On average, assuming that the items are distributed equally throughout your hash table. If you're able to force your hash table to all hash to the same element, then it degrades to what? Yeah, O of N, like it's super, and so there's actually denial of service vulnerabilities where they took advantage by knowing how the Python or how the programming language would hash values. 
they would send key value pairs to the web server that would all hash to the same value, and it would slow down the server so much that it would cause it to crash. Um, so yeah, so that's like, the program's fine. Or uh, another thing would be maybe a design flaw would be sending, uh, sending a secret private password in the clear over UDP, right? Or any kind of thing, right? Then anybody on that local network can sniff that. So even though the code, so the way I think about this, the code is doing exactly what it's supposed to do according to the design. Right? The problem is there's fundamentally a problem in how this thing was designed in the first place. Can I have a two injection on the phone? Uh, still a problem with the code. We'll see that later. Uh, so yeah, so design, so we kind of think of this as design vulnerabilities, so there's a problem in the design. Implementation vulnerabilities, so there's some problem in how the code was implemented, right? There's some, you can think of this as like, a design bug versus, or a design flaw versus an implementation bug. So what else, are these the only things? Configuration. Configuration, right? If we go even below this, it, what about when we deploy this application? You can have the world's most secure application, right? If you deploy it on a shared web server with world readable, writable directories, and where anybody can access or delete those files, right, then it's fundamentally not secure. So you have to think about all these things. So this is why when you're doing vulnerability analysis, you need to think about not only what is the design of the code, how is the code written, and where is this code, where could this code be deployed, and how is it commonly deployed? Or if you're looking at one specific instance, you want to look at how, like, is this instance installed properly and secure? Another type of deployment vulnerability that happens all the time, default passwords happens all the time, right? And that's a problem with deployment, right? The code is properly vetting username and passwords. It's not like there's a design flaw that you can get around that. It's not like they are not checking passwords correctly. It's because in deployment time, they didn't follow the steps that say, create a new password for the administrator. Cool. So design vulnerabilities are, as we said, flaws in the overall logic of the application. So this is another name for logic flaws. So another example I like is uh, you used to be able, uh, there's some websites, so you know you can have coupons on a website which will reduce the price of an item, let's say like 20%. So what if the website allowed you to keep applying a coupon over and over? Right? So to finally reduce the price to zero. Or what if the application, so you can put the quantity in on a shopping cart of how many items you're buying? Have you ever tried to buy a negative two quantity? It should reject that, right? But what if it doesn't? And what if it just says, oh yeah, great, so you're getting refunded $200 for the purchase. <laughs> right? So these are design level problems in the logic of the application. Usually these break down to some kind of lack of authentication or authorization checks. So if there's any problems there, it can also be erroneous trust assumptions. So trusting another machine or trusting a certain user when maybe you shouldn't be trusting that user. Um, and you know, there's actually a ton there. And these are actually, so part of the research that I do is in automatically identifying vulnerabilities. And identifying like logic flaw, design flaw vulnerabilities are incredibly difficult. And it comes down to this problem of the intended functionality of the application versus how the application was actually coded. So do you usually have, so you can look at the code, right? You can analyze the code to see what the code does. But where do you get that intended functionality specification from? Nowhere, it doesn't exist, it never exists. If anybody tells you that it exists, they're lying to you. It's like, oh yeah, we have UML diagrams to describe it. No, nobody has that ever, right? It's just inside the developer's head. So you have to essentially look at the code, infer what did they likely mean, and then see how that behavior diverges and that can help you identify a vulnerability. So this is actually an area that has a lot of research and really cool stuff in automatically identifying these. Uh, another classic case of this is what's called the confused deputy program. So you, uh, program, problem. So you can think about, let's say you are completely locking down a uh, Windows machine 
and you're going to say that, man, I'm going to make it so that nobody, no program uh, except for, uh, let's say, Internet Explorer can talk to the web. Right? That might be a security policy you want to implement. Now, let's say that I, as another process, I say, okay, I can't send a request to the Internet. But I really want to. I have these credit cards I want to exfiltrate and send back to me. I really want to send data requests. So I can't do it, but who can? Internet Explorer. So what if I can trick Internet Explorer to send out my data? What if I can just use remote procedure calls to ask Internet Explorer to open up uh, this, this URL and make a request for me? Right? So in there you have this, you know, this problem where we've, we've trusted this entity, we've trusted you can think of, in this case, Internet Explorer is the deputy. They're super trusted. But if we can confuse them to, to confuse the analogy of the deputy, like shoot people on our behalf, or uh, sorry, arrest people <laughs> on our behalf, right? Now they're acting as us. So it's the same as if we were doing that action, right? And so that is a very difficult problem to solve. What we're going to focus on here is mostly implementation vulnerabilities. So we're going to look at at high level, you can think of this as the application is not able to handle unexpected input. So it gets some input that either it wasn't expected or it was coded incorrectly, and it causes a uh, it causes the application to do something insecurely. So this could be unexpected input, right? So maybe we give it input that it's never been tested on before, it causes it maybe to crash or do something worse. Unexpected errors or exceptions. What if we delete the file that it thinks it's gonna read from? What does it do then? Does it just crash? Does it do something? Uh, unexpected interleaving of events. So this is especially multi-threaded code. You get this a lot. What happens if A happens and while that happens, B happens and then C happens as well, right? Does that cause a deadlock? Does it cause resources to be go haywire? Uh, is there some way we can interleave events to cause this to happen? Uh, unfiltered output, so oftentimes we'll see applications have to be careful in what they generate as output. So if they're not doing this correctly, that can lead to vulnerabilities. There's a whole host of things here. We're gonna spend a lot of our time focused on this because this requires, uh, a lot of these things require in-depth technical knowledge of how these systems work so that we can exploit these. Deployment vulnerabilities are, as we said, so some kind of incorrectly or faulty deployment or configuration right, of the application. Um, it could be installed with more privileges than the one it, than that it, uh, than it should have. For instance, if the design says, hey, this application is secure, assuming you run this program not as the administrator, and you download it and try to run it as the administrator, or, not as the administrator, it doesn't work. So you say, well, the first thing you do is type sudo first to run it as root. And magically, everything works when you run it as root. Right? But the downside is you're now running that program as root. So if there's any vulnerabilities in there, the attacker's going to become root. Uh, maybe, so if you think about all the things that you rely on for the security of your application, right? Files not being readable or writable. Right? Maybe somebody else changes that. Maybe there's a weird configuration change. Easy to guess passwords, as we said, right? There's a lot here. And the idea, the way you can tell the difference is if, the, if it was correctly deployed, then this vulnerability would not exist, right? So this is not inherent in the application itself. You can kind of think of these as like a hierarchy, right? So design flaws are at the top. They affect every single instance of that application, right? They also are more expensive to fix because they require completely re-architecting and thinking about things. Implementation bugs affect all the instances, but you can fix them fairly easily. They're usually a one-line fix, right? But now when you get to deployment vulnerabilities, my installation may be secure, but your installation may be insecure because of how you've deployed it. So we touched on this a little bit, remote versus local attacks. So you always, always need to think about, so when we think about this, uh, when we do research on security, we think about in terms of threat models. 
So we think about, I'm an attacker, what capabilities does the attacker have? Right? Can they sniff your traffic? Can they spoof your traffic? Right? What capabilities do they have? You should also be thinking like this as an attacker. What can I do? What are all the things that I can do in a remote versus a local circumstance? So what are some things? So what can you, somebody give an example of something you can do local that you can't do remote. Rip open the hard drive and start. Too local, too local. <laughs> <laughs> too local. So we keep our ideas constrained to the digital <laughs> and not to the physical, although there do exist techniques for that. It's actually a super cool, if you want to look at cool stuff, uh, there's people who've done research where they can, on a computer, if they shut it down and then they can take your RAM out and then put it in another computer and read your RAM and actually read what was in your computer. It's called a cold boot attack. And the way it's called a cold boot attack is they do it with, um, it's better so your, the RAM memory degrades slower if it's cold. So they take one of those spray cans and turn it upside down and freeze your memory essentially, make it really cold, then shut down the computer, pop the memory out, pop it in a new computer and read out all your data. So physical attacks are super cool and interesting. We're going to confine ourselves to uh, digital attacks. One attack. You could, you could read the source code or binary. Yeah, you may be able to, uh, depends, but maybe. Uh, oftentimes you can if you're local on a machine, especially if it's you running the application or you can see the application that's running, you'll know exactly what application is running and you'll have access to at least the binary. Yeah. You can actually reboot the system and BIOS or Yes, I still call that physical. <laughs> but yes, uh, yeah, you can often do that, right? You could maybe do some weird BIOS stuff. Yeah. Uh, switch users on and operating system. I may be able to try it with different users, right? If I'm on a local system, I may be able to, if I have multiple user accounts, maybe I can switch between user accounts. Maybe I can try to crack the passwords of the other users on the system to get somebody else's account. What else? Yeah, what's the next? Database, accessing database. You maybe have access to more data on a local system versus a remote system. Uh, opening multiple instances of the application. Hmm. Yeah, you, when you're local, you can maybe run multiple instances to see if there's any of these multi-threading interleaving problems. Yeah. So for remote, are we assuming we don't have full remote access for the remote terminal? Correct, that's local. We're considering that local because we're locally on the machine. We are, the terminal is remote, but the application sees us as if we were local. We have all the privileges we would have if we were local, except for physical access. So remote is when you can Wait, just like, what's that again? Remote is just when you can send packets Yes, remote would be a remote service, like a DNS server running, right? Yeah. <coughs> All these things, why can't you, why are you saying that you can't do it when you're remote? Like, it should be fine, right? like, even if it's like switching users or something. Like that. Can you switch users on my system? So if I'm running an, an HTTP server here, how can you get me to switch users? You can switch users, do whatever you want on your machine, but how can you get me to do it? Suppose I'm rude. But you're remote, you're not on my local machine. You have no access to my local machine, right? No user accounts, nothing. It's assuming you don't have, a, you don't have admin. If you have admin, then you can get in and you're local, right, at that point. But you're assuming we're a user on the system that doesn't actually yes. own the system. Yes, other thing to think about, right? If we're administrators on our system, we are the security, right? We own everything, so we don't, you know, we may want to try to find bugs, but we would find bugs by pretending to be other users, right? And say, what could this user find, right? Um, yeah, good points. But the other thing to remember is, if I'm offering a remote service that you're just accessing over TCP or UDP, if you do not have a user account on my system, you're not local, right? So you can't get me to, you can't change files on that system. Unless maybe you can, right? Maybe I'm running an FTP server on there too, and you can use that to drop some files on there, right? But if you're purely remote, you have a lot less capabilities. So let's see some of them, so. So local, we can actually, so we have more vectors we can get into the program, right? We have our local interaction that we can give input to the program. We can maybe tamper with the file system, we can maybe uh, create another process to try to do some remote procedure calls to that process. We may be able to mess with the environment. Right? This is a key, and this is very key. A lot of people get this distinction muddled in their heads. Um, 
If we are remote, we can't do any of those things, right? We don't have access to the system, we cannot force anybody to do something for us, right? So we can't add or delete a file, we can't give direct command line input or parameter command line arguments, right? We can really only send input to the system as if it's over the network. Or not only, you can think of a case where maybe an application is running that goes and fetches data from another system and uses that data, so that would be input. So if you think like, uh, it's kind of a silly example, but let's say like something, an application is taking in Twitter feeds, right? So you can put in your Twitter username, it's taking your input and putting it into the application. So in there maybe you could take the application over, even though it's not necessarily running a server and listening on any point. <laughs> but nine times out of 10, when we talk about a remote application, we're talking about a server that's listening on a port. Yes? Uh, using process scripting, we can delete data, right? So would that be a remote attack or? Depends, we'll get to that later. Cool. Um, so local attacks are usually easier because we have more information and we can control things more. Right? We can control the environment. We know exactly usually what application is running, so we can use that information to find vulnerabilities. Whereas remote, we only get access over the network. Um, so a key subset of remote attacks would be re unauthenticated remote attacks. So this is an attack that maybe we can perform or some kind of vulnerability that exists before we ever try to tell the server who we are, right? So before we log in with the username and password, if there's some vulnerability, this means anybody who can send these packets to the server can exploit that vulnerability, right? It's not just us, you have to have a user account on the system first. And so the key idea here is if we're able to, the goal usually with remote is we want to be able to execute as that remote application, right? So if we can control that remote application, we can't do everything. We only have the permissions of whatever that remote application could do. So an instance, it, another way of thinking about this is a remote attack allows you to transition into a local attack because now you're locally on the system with the permissions running as the web server, or whatever the server is running as. Then you may be able to use a local attack to then escalate up to the root or the administrator of the system and go forward from there. So usually this is how attacks will kind of go. It's remote, they'll get local access to the remote attack and then they'll use that to get more privileges and then spread it out that way. But in general, much more difficult to perform. Right? You don't even know who's there. You don't even know who you're talking to. Right? So this is why reconnaissance in the network can become so important. Right? You want to know who am I talking to because maybe I already know about a vulnerability. Right? Okay, so we need to think about the life cycle of an application so that we can walk through all the steps so that we can understand how to break them. And we're going to focus here, well, as we'll see, so the developer, the author, writes the code in a high-level language, then what happens? Yeah, so it gets depending. So there's a big fork, right, depending on if it's a compiled language like C or an interpreted language like Python. I was gonna say Java's, yeah, no, it's not really. Um, <laughs> Yeah, like Python, right? So if we take a C example, right? So the application is translated. So hopefully some of you have taken compilers. This will make all of what we're doing a lot easier. But compilation is essentially taking this programming language and producing an executable, right? And it's saved to a file. And of course, there's a difference between <coughs> interpretation and compilation, which we'll see in a second. So, how does this file get turned into code that runs on your computer? Magic. <laughs> Very good. 
There is no magic. Destroy all notions of magic. What is it? So it gets turned into assembly, so that's the, the translation. So it gets translated into an executable form. So on Windows, they'll have the extension .exe. Uh, Linux doesn't have a specific extension, so you have to go with the ELF, it's the ELF uh, file format. That's what actually happened. So we'll go into the details. I think we'll go off of, the application is somehow, which is not magic, which we'll look at, is loaded into memory. It starts executing, right? The operating system allows it to execute. So the application starts running, and then the application terminates and it goes away. So interpretation, so if we look at interpretation really quickly, the idea is the program that we want to execute is usually kept in its original programming language, like in Python a .py file. And to run that, what do you need? An interpreter. Which is what? Language relative. Program that was compiled. Yes, it was another program that was compiled. It's an executable file just like other programs that you write. There's nothing special about the Python program versus the CAT program versus the BAT program versus the LS program. Right? These are all programs that were written in a language that were compiled down to some executable form, which we'll look at. So, but Python is special, so we think of it differently because it, it, its job is not to do anything. Its job is to do what? Interpret a Python file, right? So take in a Python source code as input and execute each of the instructions according to the Python specification. Uh, so this, of course, there's all kinds of, you know, maybe not going line by line in Python, there's oftentimes uh, intermediate transformations, so there's PYC files, which are the Python uh, byte, the byte, I think it's considered byte code. Um, and each instruction is parsed and executed one at a time. That's the main difference here. Um, and one of the interesting things that we'll come back to, that will be a theme, is a lot of interpreted languages are easy to generate and execute code dynamically. So what does this mean? So you could take user input and transform it into code and run that if you want. So it doesn't have to be user input, so let's just say any kind of string. Input. A string, yes, that's the key, right? So the program can take a string that it has dynamically created from reading from a file or getting file from the uh, data from the user. It can take that string and execute it and turn it into code as if it was written right there in the file. So these are usually the eval family of, of functions. Bash has it, Python has it, JavaScript has it. Uh, they're all inherently evil, but we won't talk about that now. <laughs> Compilation. So, what are the steps in the C compiler at a high level? What happens first? So we want to. Isn't like some sort of a preprocessor? Yes. So the first thing is the preprocessor, which does what? Makes it most of it. syntax. The preprocessor gets rid of all those pounds, right? So the pound define, or the pound, what, pound include, literally like copies the code into there, right? So the first thing that runs is a preprocessor that gets rid of all the macros, uh, evaluates all the flags, all the defines, everything like that is included in the preprocessor. Um, then at a high level, now we have a C program. Now we're going to turn that into assembly code, right? So we turn that into some architecture-specific assembly. So what are some assembly languages? MIPS. MIPS. <laughs> X86. 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 ARM. ARM. Spark. AMD64. 64, AMD64, yeah. So the two, well, I'm trying to think. We're going to focus in this class on x86. But everything that we're going to learn is applicable to all these other languages. You just have to keep that in mind as we go through them. I feel like x86 is like going to the DOS. Is that like the? Uh, I believe the, you mean the name? Like, I thought it was going to be like x86. I'm 
think it did. It has to do with the processor. So the processor is the, I think it's the 8086 that it was the instruction set for that. And so future pieces of hardware, they basically decided to be backwards compatible with that system will support the same assembly language for each of the chips. And it's stuck throughout time because nobody wanted to rewrite the applications. I don't know how much that has to do with DOS, but uh, the really interesting thing now is the processors, even if the programs are running x86, inside the processor, it translates x86 instructions to microcode, which it actually executes on the processor. So there's even another layer of abstraction below x86. <coughs> Uh, so you can actually, if you've never done this before, to see what assembly your program will run, you can run GCC dash capital S on your C code and it will output the X86 or whatever language you're programming in. M32 is going to be a super important option for everything we do here because this will compile it in 32-bit even if you're running on a 64-bit operating system. Um, all right, cool. So we can stop here.